Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wait until we get a couple of more. Logged in, awesome. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, I went ahead and added a little question in the chat box, um, just letting everybody know good afternoon and just feel free to let us know um, where you're watching us from. We're always um, curious to know uh, since we get a lot of attendees from all over the world, which is super exciting. Um, but welcome to our endometriosis family support group webinar. My name is Bianca Gonzalez and I'm the bullying prevention program coordinator with the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. Um, first off, I want to go ahead and thank our wonderful sponsor, the Riverside Medical Clinic, um, as well as um, Advi for their support. Um, we truly appreciate it. And just a little bit of logistics when it comes to using Zoom, we are going to have a Q&A towards the end of the webinar. So any questions, any comments, we will go ahead and get those answered for you. And it'll be towards the bottom of the screen and you'll see the little chat box icon where you're able to add those in there. There's also a Q&A portion where you can add any questions um, in that portion as well. So I wanna go ahead and introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Sadiqa Bebehani. And I wanna go ahead and just introduce a little bit about her before I give it away to her. So Dr. Sadiqa Bebehani specializes in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, as well as minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. She completed a Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada Fellowship at McGill University, which allows her to skillfully treat all aspects of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. In addition, she has completed a second fellowship in minimally invasive gynecologic surgery at the Mayo Clinic and can perform complex pelvic surgeries with both laparoscopy and robotics. Being double fellowship trained, she can appropriately treat all surgical conditions, especially those that affect fertility, such as endometriosis and fibroids. So this webinar will focus on atypical locations of endometriosis and the symptoms associated with disease found in those locations. So I want to now go ahead and give it away to Dr. Bebehani. Thank you so much, Blanca. Hello, everybody. I'm Sadika. Thank you so much for the introduction. As you can see from my background, I'm in um, beautiful, sunny Southern California right now. But I was not always that fortunate. So I did train at McGill University, which is in Montreal, Canada. And for those of you who have been north of the border, it gets really cold in Canada. And so right now my friends are freezing. It's probably around minus 20 degrees right now, Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Still getting used to the Fahrenheit weather here. But I am here today to talk to you all about the atypical locations of endometriosis. I would love to hear your thoughts and questions. You can always type them down in the chat box. We can get to them at the end. I don't have the availability or the ability to see your text as they come through. And so I apologize if I'm unable to answer or respond to your concerns right away, but we'll get to them at the end. So a little bit more about me, as Blanca said, I am um, double fellowship trained in REI, which is reproductive endocrinology and infertility and minimally invasive gynecologic surgery. But I'm also a mother of three kids. And so I love my work. I spend probably almost all my day at work here. And then when I go home, I have, I have my three kids to take care of, which is great. I love them. But for you um, women out there who are mothers, you know, that's also a lot of hard work. But I value the, uh, the time and the and just, you know, I, I think I'm lucky to be able to be, to be a parent and to be able to take care of my kids. And I really feel passionate about helping all women achieve that goal, goal if that is something they desire. And so for, for women who are struggling with infertility, who have ish, problems getting pregnant, please don't give up. There is always something we can do to help you achieve your goals, okay? And endometriosis, unfortunately, is one of those big diseases that can affect fertility. But that's why doctors like myself and, and others who treat infertility, that's what we're here for. We're here to help you through this difficult journey. I do see a lot of endometriosis patients. It is, uh, it is probably um, takes up about, I would say 75% of my practice. And today what I would like to talk about is not the typical endometriosis that you probably see when you have early stage disease, but atypical locations that are mostly associated with more advanced disease that require a little bit more skill and sensitivity in being able to diagnose and treat those conditions. 
So for those of you who are here, I suspect that you probably know a little bit about endometriosis, but just for, 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 for the people who are listening who don't know what endometriosis is, basically it is the presence of endometrial glands and stroma outside the uterus. So typically those glands and stroma may implant on the ovaries, on the peritoneum. Those two locations are common and are more likely to occur first before the lesions travel outside the pelvis. Lesions can go all the way up to the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is the muscle that helps us breathe. It's the muscle that separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. And in advanced stages of endometriosis, the lesions may travel all the way up there to that muscle, the diaphragm muscle. It can go on the bowel. So the bowel is the organ that transfers food from our mouth all the way down to the rectum. And the rectum is where the, the stool come out from when we have bowel movements. And so the bowel can be really high up like the stomach and the proximal small bowel, or it could be lower down right behind the uterus, which is the lower rectum. That's the last portion of the bowel before the stool comes out. It can be on the bladder. So the bladder is the organ that holds the urine and it sits right in front of the uterus. And so the endometriosis can grow superficial on the bladder or deep into the bladder. And I'll show you more uh, and talk a little bit more about bladder endometriosis in a little bit. But this is just you know a couple of locations that more commonly endometriosis tends to grow in. Endometriosis has been reported in almost all organs. I think with the exception of the spleen, there hasn't been any reported endometriosis on the spleen yet. There are There is endometriosis reported on almost all other organs, including the eyes, the brain. And so we have to take this condition seriously. And the reason why I bring this up is because as gynecologists, we are more used to treating the pelvic area, right? The uterus, the ovaries. I don't typically operate on the eyes. I don't typically operate on the brain. You need an ophthalmologist and a brain surgeon to operate in those sensitive areas. But brain surgeons and eye doctors don't know anything about endometriosis because it's really not their specialty. Endometrial glands, the word endometrium, refers to the lining of the uterus. So anything to do with the uterus and pelvic organs is automatically gynecology territory. And that's why the gynecologist should be the person that connects the team together. And so if a gynecologist suspects that this patient has eye endometriosis, brain endometriosis, heart, lungs, anywhere, then they should be the best person to help find a specialist that can treat that condition. And I don't typically send patients to the brain surgeon and then say, oh, I'll see you when, when your treatment is done. I have to actively be involved with their care because the brain surgeon may be very skilled at cutting out tumors from the brain or at removing cysts from the brain, but they don't know anything about endometriosis. So we really need to collaborate and work together in order to provide patients with the best care. And so symptoms related to endometriosis that typically grows in the pelvis is usually everything and anything to do with pain. So it could be pain with bowel movements, it could be pain with urinating. It could be pain with sexual activity. But most commonly, the pain starts with the period. So pain with menstrual periods is the classic landmark of endometriosis. And I always tell women that pain with their periods is never normal. Pain that allows you or that prevents you from going to school is never normal. If you have a little bit of cramps and you're like, oh, I'm on my period, but it's okay, I'll go to work, I'll be fine and you forget about it the rest of the day because you're busy at work, that's fine, that's normal. But if you're experiencing pain that is severe enough to keep you from your normal daily activities or that's severe enough to keep you home from school or work, that is not normal. You need to see a specialist and you need to talk about why you're experiencing that pain and what can be done to prevent this from happening again. So while pain may typically start with the period, it then may progress where the pain can occur between periods, the pain can occur with movement, the pain can occur with act different activities like sexual activity. Sometimes women say, well, sex is only painful in some condition, in some positions, not in other positions. That still doesn't rule out endometriosis. Having pain in certain positions may just mean that with penetration, as the uterus moves in a certain way, it may pull on those endometriotic lesions and it may cause pain in some positions, but not in others. 
Infertility. Unfortunately, patients with endometriosis can have issues getting pregnant. The good thing is 70% of women who have endometriosis will conceive naturally. Okay, so if you are diagnosed with endometriosis, please don't automatically think that you can't get pregnant because 70% of women will be able to achieve naturally. It's only 30% of women with endometriosis who will have issues getting pregnant. And back in the old days, endometriosis used to fall under the unexplained category where we can't really find anything wrong with the couple. We do all the tests, the man's sperm looks okay. The woman's tubes look fine. She's ovulating. People didn't really ask too many questions about their periods, but now our patients should be educated enough to say, hey, I think I may have endometriosis or hey, my periods are really painful. Is this normal? Or I have pain with sexual activity. Is this normal? And that may raise the concern that there could be endometriosis there. And whenever we suspect endometriosis, the diagnosis, unfortunately, is surgery. It's the only way to prove that there's endometriosis. We can suspect endometriosis based on women's symptoms. We can suspect endometriosis if we find an endometrioma, a cyst on the ovary. But having a normal ultrasound, having a normal MRI does not exclude endometriosis. You can still have endometriosis and have normal imaging. The only way to confirm that endometriosis is in fact present is to take a biopsy. And I'm going to show you here what the biopsy looks like. So we take a biopsy from lesions that we suspect are endometriosis. We send them to the pathologist. The pathologist looks under the microscope and is able to see endometrial glands and endometrial stroma. So those arrows are pointing at the patho patho uh, pathological lesions that the pathologist will review at the time of surgery. And this is how endometriosis is diagnosed and this is how endometriosis is confirmed. Now, before I move on, I have to, to say something. My next, um, all the rest of my slides are all surgery pictures. So I hope that none of you get bothered by looking at internal organs and looking at surgery. If you do, then please don't look at the screen. I'll still be talking. You're more than welcome to listen. But if you get grossed out by looking at surgery pictures, then the next couple of slides may be a little bit too much. But I would like to show you a video of what endometriosis typically looks like and where we can find endometriosis, including lesions that are found in atypical locations. So bear with me for a second. I think if I click on this link, it should work. And if it doesn't, I will. Atypical locations of endometriosis. Can you see it? Cheyenne or Blanca, if you just give me a thumbs up. Yep. Did you hear the audio too? Uh, yes. Perfect. Great. So I made this video when I was at the Mayo Clinic. I was I um, trained with Dr. Javier Magrina and Dr. Megan Lawson, who are both excellent endometriosis excision surgeons. Dr. Javier Magrina was actually one of the pioneers of robotic surgery, and I am extremely happy to have had the opportunity to train with him. So while I do surgery both robotically and laparoscopically, um, I do uh, tend to prefer the ro robot sometimes or most of the time because in my hands, I feel like it allows me to look in all the sensitive areas in the pelvis in order not to miss any disease that's there. And so this video shows both laparoscopic and robotic images of what things look like inside the pelvis when there is endometriosis. I'm going to put the volume up so you can hear this well. And this is a couple of minutes long. Okay, so let's go ahead. Endometriosis. The objective of this video is to recognize the atypical locations of endometriosis lesions. Endometriosis is the presence of endometriotic glands and stroma outside the uterus. While endometriotic implants commonly grow in the pelvis, endometriosis has been reported in many different organs. Atypical locations of endometriotic implants encountered by minimally invasive gynecological surgeons include the diaphragm, appendix, bowel, and skin. In patients with chronic pelvic pain, a thorough survey of the pelvis is commonly performed in search for endometriosis. 
Inspection must be systematic in order not to miss visible lesions. While it is common to start in the pelvis, the upper abdomen should also be inspected during diagnostic laparoscopy. The peritoneal surfaces are inspected closely from the pelvis all the way up to... Oh, I, I apologize. I don't know why it stopped. Let me stop sharing. It's okay, we'll get back to the rest of that video. Let me just go back to sharing my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, great. You can see my slides now, right? Yes? Great. Okay. I see a thumbs up. Okay. I apologize. I'm not sure why the video uh, cut off in the middle. I will play it again at the end, but you get the idea, right? So surgery is very dependent on who's performing the actual procedure because a thorough survey looking all around the abdomen and the pelvis is very important with endometriosis. And the surgeon must be able to recognize the appearance of lesions that are suspicious to be endometriosis. Because like I said, we can't really confirm it unless we've excised the lesion and sent it to the pathologist to look at under the microscope. And so I, I you know, see a lot of patients who have diagnostic laparoscopies, they may have ablation or burning of, of lesions, but no tissue is actually removed for diagnosis. And in situations like that, there is no way to confirm for sure that there is endometriosis there because it was never really sent to for, to, uh, for the pathologist to look at. The other thing is if you are not comfortable recognizing the different appearance of the lesions, lesions may be missed. And so I showed a couple of subtle looking red spider web lesions. To someone else's eye, they may say, oh, this is normal. There is nothing there. But because I do endometriosis all the time, I know that those lesions could be endometriosis. And unless I remove them, I can't say for sure that there is no disease there. Okay, here we go. So we talked about typical and atypical locations of endometriosis. So what are typical locations? So if you look here, this is actually the uterus. This is called the cul-de-sac. This is the bowel. Oh, sorry, you can see my, my arrow. This is the bow bowel, okay? This is the uterus. And this here is called the cul-de-sac. It's the area between the bowel and the uterus. And then you see all those blue, red hemorrhagic spots here. You see those look blue. And then there's a couple of clear vesicular lesions here. All of this is endometriosis. And so it typically likes to hide right there on those uterosacral ligaments. The ligament is what holds the uterus to the pelvic sidewall. And so when women are sexually active and the uterus is moving with penetration, it pulls on those lesions. And that's what creates pain with sexual activity. And you can see here, I'm lifting the peritoneum away from all the structures underneath it to remove those lesions because right underneath this lesion is the ureter. The ureter is what transports the urine from the kidneys to the bladder. And so, in the hands of surgeons that are not comfortable dissecting that ureter out, they won't be able to remove those lesions safely because in order for me to cut around this lesion, I need to make sure that I'm not cutting the ureter. And the other thing with endometriosis is that the lesions can grow deep and can wrap around structures. So this lesion that I see here sitting right on top of the ureter, I don't know how deep down it goes. It may very well likely be obstructing the ureter. It may be growing deep into the ureter, causing scarring and fibrosis around the ureter. So it's important to be able to remove that lesion, cut around it, and try and feel the tissue underneath it. Because if I just treat the top, then I'm treating the tip of the iceberg, right? If I just treat the top, I don't know how deep down it goes and I could be leaving a lot of disease underneath. And so we always have to pick up the lesion, start dissecting the important structures and go as deep down as I need to go. So this is the uterosacral ligament. The next common spot that endometriosis likes to grow on is the ovary. 
This is a big ovarian cyst, an ovarian endometrioma. You can see it has a blue tinge. It's actually filled with what we call endometriotic fluid, which is brown. Some people call this a chocolate cyst because the fluid in it is brown, looks like chocolate. This is the uterus. This is the fallopian tube, and this is the other ovary. And you can see this other ovary is much smaller. This is what a normal sized ovary would look like. Endometriosis on the ovary can be superficial. So if you look here, this lesion is very small compared to this lesion right here. I might have been able to see this on ultrasound. Technically, we should be able to see this cyst on the ultrasound. It's quite big, but this cyst may not be seen on ultrasound. This may look like you know nothing on ultrasound, just normal ovarian tissue. But when I go in surgically and I see it, I have to remove it. Because if I don't remove it, it can end up looking like this cyst right here in a couple of months or a couple of years. That's the other thing with endometriosis. We don't know how fast it grows. Some women can have very slow growing disease and others can have very rapid growing disease. And so any, any tiny lesion needs to be removed because it may look tiny today, but it may be a big problematic lesion in the future. And our goal is to try and do one surgery and do one good surgery where women hopefully would not have to go through this again. I talked about the bladder, right? And the endometriotic lesions growing on the bladder. So back to the ovary, what are symptoms when women have lesions on their ovaries? Typically it's pelvic pain, pain with their periods, pain with ovulation, pain with sex. This ovary is really big and it's pushing on the bowel. So it's normal or common to experience pain with bowel movements. Women may also experience changes in their bowel movements when they're on their period because that ovary can get really inflamed and can start aggravating the bowel around it. When we have the same lesions, we see those powder burn blue lesions. This is the uterus. This is the cul-de-sac, the rectum. This is the uterosacral ligament that we talked about. And right here is the bladder. So again, we see those lesions. Those appear to be superficial on the bladder peritoneum, but I won't know until I cut those lesions out. So what are symptoms that women can experience when they have lesions on their bladder peritoneum like that? They may feel the need to avoid very frequently during the day. They may feel urgency where when they need to go, they need to go right away. They may experience pain when, you're ur when they're urinating. A very common symptom is pain as the bladder is filling. So as the bladder is filling, those lesions get stretched and women may experience pain that even after they empty their bladder, the pain can persist. Some women, if this lesion is deep and goes all the way into the bladder, may experience bleeding when they're on their period. So they can bleed into the bladder and have blood in urine when they're menstruating. And it may be hard to differentiate blood coming from the vagina and mixing with, with the urine versus urine that's bloody. But women who have bloody urine can usually tell because they've had vaginal bleeding for years, right, with their periods. And that, now they notice that the, the blood is different because as soon as they start urinating, the toilet bowl looks red and they haven't yet started bleeding from the vagina. But if it's hard to differentiate, we can always check in the office and try and get a urine sample and test if there's blood there or not. Another common location is, is the cul-de-sac. And I like to use all those scientific terms because, you know, I want to educate everybody on the proper terms to use with endometriosis so that patients can advocate for themselves. And if their doctors are not really taking their pain seriously, then you have to find someone else because this pain is real. And as endometriosis surgeons, we know what, what the lesions look like. And I know what symptoms women may experience, but I want to hear what your thoughts are and what your symptoms are so that we can try and come up with a plan that's best suited for you. And so endometriosis can grow in this spot called the cul-de-sac that's right behind the uterus. And I suspect cul-de-sac endometriosis when women say that they have pain with bowel movements and pain with sexual activity. This is the bowel. Look how close the bowel is to those endometriotic lesions. This is the uterus, this is the bowel, and it's right in the middle between the bowel and the uterus. And again, those lesions sometimes are actually deep and they may go all the way into the bladder. But this is a very common location where endometriosis likes to hide in. It's called the cul-de-sac. You can see here the lesions can be brown, um, red. They can be clear, like those lesions here. They can be 
stained, hemosiderin stained lesions like that. In order to remove the disease, we would need to remove all this peritoneum. And the good thing about the peritoneum is it grows back. It grows back in about two to seven days. And so two days, three days, four days after surgery, this whole area would have reperitonized. So the peritoneum grows back again. And the peritoneum that grows back hopefully would be healthier peritoneum because endometriosis may be present from a really early age or may tend to grow with time. And so if we remove all the disease and healthy peritoneum replaces that area, then hopefully that healthy peritoneum, first of all, will not have any endometriosis on it. And the second thing is if endometriosis were to develop on the peritoneum, it would take a long time. And this is why I typically quote recurrence rates of about 20 to 25% over five years. So we know that endometriosis can come back, but it doesn't come back right away. It takes time. And we don't know if the rate of recurrence is different based on the approach or the type of surgery that, that is performed. We know that different surgeons can have different techniques. And so the rate is kind of global covering all aspects of excisional surgery. But if we do remove those lesions right here and remove a wide margin around them, then the thought is that the recurrence should be even lower than that. It should be even lower than 20 to 25% over five years. Okay, now we get to the more interesting locations, the diaphragm. So we talked about the diaphragm being the muscle that separates the chest cavity from the abdomen. So lesions can grow up there on the diaphragm. And again, if we don't look, we may not know that there's endometriosis there. So whenever we do surgery, like I showed you with that quick video, we look in the pelvis, but then we also start looking up above where the liver is, the diaphragm, because the way the air circulates in the peritoneal cavity, cells from the pelvis can travel up to the right side of the chest, then they go to the left side of the chest, then they circulate down. So it's like a circular motion. And for that reason, it is more common to see right-sided endometriosis of the chest and the lungs compared to the left side. So if you look here, those lesions appear more white scarred lesions. Those appear blue, black powder burn lesions. Those are both on the diaphragm. So this is the liver here, and this is the diaphragm. And those lesions can cause chest pain with the period they can cause shortness of breath with periods. If those lesions are deep and they extend all the way into the lung, women may experience pneumothorax. Pneumothorax means that the lungs can collapse and air can grow between the lung and the tissue around it. And that can happen in a cyclical manner where women will have shortness of breath, chest pain, pneumothorax only while they're on their period, or it can happen between periods as well sometimes. And so if we notice that women are having those chest symptoms regularly, not only during their period, does not exclude endometriosis. So I hear it sometimes from, from lung surgeons who'll say, oh, her, her pneumothorax occurs at different times. It may be with her period or it may be not during her period. And for that reason, we don't think it's endometriosis. That's incorrect. There are multiple studies that have shown that even in women who have pneumothorax and chest symptoms outside of their periods, it could still be endometriosis. I don't operate on the lung cavity. I am not a lung surgeon, but my goal is to diagnose the disease and find patients, the best surgeon who can operate on that spot. And so if I see diaphragm lesions like that at the time of surgery, I will remove them. If I see a lung lesion that's deep in the lung, then I will find the best person for that patient who can resect that lung lesion. And so pain, shortness of breath, sometimes even coughing up blood during the period are all signs of possibly having endometriosis of the lung and chest cavity. How about the bowel? So we talked about the pelvis and the sigmoid colon and the rectum, which is the lower part of the bowel area that evacuates the stool right out of the rectum. But the bowel actually go all the way to the chest as well. All our abdominal pelvic cavities occupied by bowel. Bowel could be small bowel. They're usually thin and long and they're, you know, kind of swimming around like a bag of forms, or it could be the large bowel. The large bowel is the rectum, which is the bottom that goes up to the sigmoid, and that's where the appendix comes out from. 
that cecum, which is still large bowel. And then after that comes the small bowel all the way up to the stomach. And so endometriosis can grow anywhere in that GI tract. It could be small, it could be large bowel. So if we look here, this is a superficial lesion, the same appearance as the lesions I showed you down in the pelvis, but this is actually bowel that's really high up. It's a very small lesion. If I wasn't looking for it, I could have missed it. This is a bigger lesion here. So this lesion is actually the large bowel, the small bowel, and the appendix. The whole area here was occupied by a large endometriotic nodule. And so patients who have bowel endometriosis typically will have pain with bowel movements. They can have diarrhea, they can have constipation. They can have blood in their stool. Sometimes those symptoms only occur while they're on their period, but other times those symptoms may occur the whole time throughout the month. It's hard to predict what will make the pain occur, uh, worse. When we do colonoscopy, so if we were to put in a camera through the mouth or through the rectum and look at the inside of the bowel, with this lesion here, we're not going to see anything, right? Because it's not a deep lesion, it's a superficial lesion. So even though it's superficial, it can still irritate the bowel and cause a lot of symptoms. And the colonoscopy will not diagnose a lesion like this one. Here, on the other hand, it depends if the colonoscopy went to that, to that spot or not. And even then, it may look normal from the inside. So if there are a couple of millimeters of normal tissue, so let's say this endometriotic lesion stops right here, and that's the lumen, the inside of the bowel, it may appear completely normal when we look at the bowel from the inside. But you can see here, this doesn't look normal at all, right? It's very red and inflamed and angry. More pictures of bowel endometriosis. So here, you know, this can easily be dismissed as, as nothing, really, if you're not looking for it. But this bowel is kinked. So it's coming in this way, and then there's something here obstructing it, and then the rest of the bowel goes over there. This is small bowel that's really dilated, that looks almost like large bowel. And you can see a lot of scar around it here. This is not normal. And so typically women who have lesions like that on their small bowel will have a lot of pain, diarrhea with their bowel movements. They may even have a lot of bloating. Typically when women have those symptoms, they don't see a gynecologist, right? You'd see a bowel doctor first, a GI doctor, a primary care doctor. And so it is important to educate our colleagues as well on the symptoms of endometriosis to make sure that patients get appropriately referred to the right person. And so I'm fortunate to work closely with a couple of bowel or GI doctors. Whenever they have patients that complain of you know, bowel symptoms, they're young, they have painful periods, they suspect they have endometriosis, they'll send them over to our team. And we do the same. If I have patients who have endometriosis, I treat all their disease, I remove the endometriosis, but the bowel symptoms don't go away, which is expected because imagine having to live with this lesion for a long time, everything is just inflamed. And so surgery is only the first step of a long process to kind of reverse everything that's been going on. And so we cut that segment of bowel out, connect the bowel together. The bowel is still inflamed, it's still angry. We just did surgery, we cut everything out. And so the motility of the bowel, the way the bowel contracts and pushes the food down may be affected for longer than a couple of weeks or a couple of months after surgery. And so typically I'll send my patients to see a GI doctor who can do the appropriate tests to figure out what else we can do to help improve the pain symptoms. Sometimes the endometriosis is not in the bowel, it's in the pelvic area, the, the spots that I showed you, uterosacral, cul-de-sac, but when the bowel moves around and hits those lesions, it can cause a lot of pain and inflammation. And so having pain with bowel movement doesn't automatically mean that there is deep endometriosis like this, but raises the suspicion that there's probably some endometriosis going on in the pelvic cavity. This is what it looks like when we remove the bowel. So if you see here, this is the bowel lumen. So this is where the stool comes out from. And then all of this is endometriosis. It's almost the same size as the bowel loop, right? So bowel loop, this is all endometriosis. And this lesion was very big and deep where we couldn't just shave it off. We had to remove the whole lesion. And those pictures, I have to say, I got them from Dr. Magrina with his permission. Those were surgeries that he had performed. And he did a great thing of trying to educate our colleagues and gynecologists and, and people who are training to become GYN surgeons on what endometriosis looks like. So he kept 
really good portfolio of images. And those two I did take from him on what bowel endometriosis looks like. So here you see all that blue stuff. Anything blue like that on the bowel is not normal. And so this was all endometriosis. Next picture is again, very interesting and very rare liver endometriosis. So you see the liver has a lot of those blue spots. You see kind of hemorrhagic fluid right here. This patient had to have this whole lobe of the liver removed because there was endometriosis everywhere on that liver. This is extremely rare endometriosis of the liver. But this patient had to have this liver removed because of the endometriosis that was on it. Skin endometriosis. So typically skin endometriosis is not something that women are born with. Endometriosis of the skin occurs as a consequence of surgery. So this is a C-section scar here. And this is endometriosis of a C-section scar. So how does that happen? When the baby is born, we cut through the skin, we cut through the muscle of the uterus, we get the baby out, and then we close the layers of the uterus and we close the skin. The baby travels from inside the uterus through the muscle layer of the uterus and out the skin. And sometimes the cells that are attached or attaching the baby and the placenta are the lining cells, they're the endometrial cells. And sometimes those cells, as we're delivering the baby and as we're doing our C-section, can travel outside and attach to the skin. And once they attach to the skin, they're cells that typically would live inside the uterus, they start producing the endometrial glands and stroma that I showed you on the pathology that typically would only be found inside the uterus. So those lesions can travel outside and form implants on the skin. And those implants can be very painful. So women may notice swelling of those implants when they're on their period, because like the uterine cells will respond to a period, those cells on the skin will also respond to the same hormonal stimulation. Or there may come a point where those implants are just inflamed and angry and red like that all the time. And so whenever we see lesions on the skin that are suspicious for endometriosis, we need to ask the appropriate questions. Was there surgery there on that area done? Should we remove that scar? And how deep does this lesion go? Because if it's only on the skin, that's not a big deal. We can definitely remove the skin, but there are layers underneath that skin. There's muscle, there's fascia. And if it involves full thickness, the fascia, the muscles, the skin and all the layers, and it's a big lesion, women may sometimes need mesh in that area. And mesh is synthetic material that we put in there that can act as, as um, a barrier or as a support method to the lesion that we've removed. So if I cut out a big chunk of tissue there, we need to put mesh to replace that tissue that was removed. And you know, mesh is not nothing really fun to have. And so we typically try and avoid it if we can, but occasionally the lesions are very big and we need to put some support in there. The other picture is umbilical endometriosis. Again, we use the belly button to do surgery for endometriosis, for fibroids, adenomyosis. And so anytime we remove uterine tissue through the belly button, we risk having cells implant in that area. And that's why whenever I remove cells from the uterus, I always put them in a bag first. It's called the tissue extraction bag. It's a surgical bag that we can use. It can be small, it can be big, depending on your specimen. We put it in, I put my specimen in the bag, close the bag, and then remove the bag through the belly button. So this just this morning, I was doing surgery for a patient who had uh, adenomyoma. So it's like adenomyosis, a really big mass in the uterus that is actually almost like endometriosis of the uterus. And um, the lesions started to kind of um, crumble up and I got a couple of small pieces of it. And I asked my assistant to immediately hand me the bag. And the medical student asked me why. He said, this piece is small, you can easily just pull it out. And I said, I don't want to risk having that lesion implant on the patient's port site. So the port site is the skin where we put our laparoscopic ports. And so I put, I put everything in a bag, close the bag, and then safely remove it through the skin so that I don't risk having those cells implant on the skin. Again, not common, very rare, but those patients may not automatically go and see a gynecologist for that lesion, right? 
they're more likely to go to dermatologists or their primary care. And so if, if all our, our providers and our physicians are well informed of what endometriosis may look like, then we can transfer patients to the appropriate physician to handle the situation. And endometriosis is a complex disease. We always need to have a multidisciplinary approach and seek help from our colleagues. So for a lesion like that, again, it may require some expert uh, repair. And so we can cut it out, but then if we need to put a mesh in, if we need to create an artificial belly button or create or recreate, let's say a belly button, because when we remove all that disease, then there's a big round hole and you know the belly button is an important part of our body. And so we want to be able to create something that looks similar to a natural belly button. And so I may contact my plastic surgery colleagues, my general surgery colleagues to ask them for help so that we can ultimately perform the best surgery for the patient in order to get rid of the disease and repair the tissue that's there. Vaginal endometriosis. So this is not a cervix. It look, may look like it, but this is actually um, a vagina. And right here, this is endometriosis of the vagina. Same here, this patient had the hysterectomy. So this is endometriosis of the vagina. And sometimes vaginal endometriosis may be, again, caused by pulling a uterus out through the vagina during a hysterectomy or it may be because of, like I showed you in the other pictures, cul-de-sac endometriosis that's just deep and growing into the vagina. Women with vaginal endometriosis may have pain with sexual activity, they may have bleeding with sexual activity, or they may have persistent vaginal discharge. And so one thing we have to remember in women who have had a hysterectomy, if they have a lot of discharge and a lot of bleeding after sex, we need to do a, an appropriate exam and look for those lesions that may be endometriosis down there. Couple more slides and then I'll, I'll have everybody ask their questions. I want to make sure I, I finish early to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions. Okay, bladder. We talked about, super, I showed you the superficial bladder lesions, but look at this. This is the bladder. This is the abdominal wall. This is a deep lesion on the bladder. And those are actually two different patients, but just to show that this is what it looks like from up top laparoscopically. And this is what it looks like on cystoscopy. So. Putting in a camera into the bladder is an important part of the diagnostic surgery that we do for endometriosis because the camera inside the bladder can allow me to view and see those lesions right here. So, so those are blue lesions that look like endometriotic spots and those lesions were there because this patient had a deep lesion that extends from the outside all the way through her bladder into the inside of the bladder. And so this is what it would look like on the outside, and this is what it would look like on the inside of the bladder. Okay, and so that is it for pictures. For those of you who are interested in talking more about endometriosis, I am more than happy to see you in the clinic. We do telehealth visits. So you can be at home, we can do a computer visit. You don't even have to drive all the way up here. I do work closely with my colleagues, Dr. Mallory Stuperich, who's also a MIG surgeon and an endometriosis specialist, and Dr. Summer Nahas, who's a GYN oncologist. And I love working with Dr. Nahas because she has the additional experience of doing those really difficult bowel resections, doing the diaphragm excisions. As she's an oncologist, she's typically used to treating cancer in those, in those areas. And so when we work together, I can bring in the endometriosis and fertility perspective. She brings in the surgical experience of removing those difficult large lesions on those sensitive organs. And we're typically able to handle our patient's care without having to refer them to uh, other bowel surgeons who may not be as comfortable in the pelvis as we gynecologists are. I am on Facebook, so if you'd like to look me up, you can just type in uh, my name on Facebook. You can always message me on Facebook, although I'd have to say I don't typically respond to patient concerns on social media because of safety and privacy issues. But I also am on Twitter if you'd like to follow me. And that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I will stop sharing and I will be happy to take any questions. And if you guys are interested in finishing up that video, I can also pull it up at the end if we have time.
Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, we have a couple of questions already. Um, I want to start off with one of them that um, was input in the chat box early on um, from Zara. And it's a couple of questions within a question. So um, they want to know, I've been wondering how about the contents of endometriotic cysts on ovaries? Where does it go when imaging scans shows it has shrunk from previous results? So that's the first question. Um, yeah, so let me, we can do where, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I pulled up the chat box. I can see it here. I can read the rest Sorry. of it. So Zara, that's a great question. So sometimes women get put on hormones or actually drugs that suppress hormones like Lupron. And Lupron has been shown to possibly shrink the size of lesions, whether they're in the ovary or outside the ovary. Because what happens with endometriosis is that tissue is lined by endometrial glands and stroma. And endometrial glands and stroma may continue to bleed and produce what typically would be a menstrual period when it's inside the uterus. When it's in the ovary, it produces fluid that creates that chocolate cyst material. So when you take some medications, whether it's Lupron or you're on birth control pills, the content of the endometrioma may dry up a little as the body absorbs it because the cells are not as active as they are when you're not on Lupron. And so that those um, the inside content of the cyst may get reabsorbed a little where the cyst can shrink. The only thing is when the patient comes off those medications, the lining, the glands and stroma are still there. And so there will be, again, inflammation and growth of that cyst. Medication doesn't make the endometriosis go away. It may control the symptoms. So let's say if someone has really painful periods and then they go on the birth control pill, they're not having periods anymore, they may feel better because they no longer experience pain or they are no longer experiencing bleeding but the lesions will still be there. And so when you stop the birth control pills, then the pain restarts. The lesions may not progress as, progress as fast when women are on some hormonal suppression, but as soon as they stop the suppression, the lesions will grow. And while they're on suppression, they may still grow, but they may grow more slowly. And so it's not really treating the problem. It's like putting a Band-Aid on the problem. How is it excreted or if it is too reabsorbed? Yes, so it doesn't go away. It's not excreted, you're right. It just, the body can reabsorb a little bit of that content to make it look like it has shrunk. Is there a documentation of deep infiltrating endometriosis nodules also observed to be shrinking on imaging tests without any surgical intervention? Yes, through the same mechanism is that the content that's being produced by those cells can get reabsorbed and can shrink but the more important question is, do those glands and stroma become inactive forever? Or will they then start producing more inflammatory material once women come off those treatment modalities? And the latter is probably more likely. Is there, if there has been, is it known or theorized how it is excreted or if it is reabsorbed? Yeah, I think we've answered that. It gets reabsorbed, it doesn't get excreted still stays this glands and stroma are still there. Okay, I'll move on to the next question from L4 and I see it here. If a woman has had endometriosis excision surgery and a complete hysterectomy, do you typically not recommend the use of hormones to treat menopause symptoms due to estrogen possibly causing endometriosis to grow again? That's a very, very good question, L4. And <laughs> I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, so I really care about women's hormones as well. And women who have premature menopause. So if their ovaries were removed at an age that's younger than the natural age of menopause, which typically is at 51 to 52, their hearts, their bones, their mental health, they all deteriorate. And so I don't think we should solve one problem and create another problem. And so I do typically recommend that women who have their ovaries removed go on some sort of estrogen replacement therapy because women who don't have that estrogen will have earlier um, they'll have a um, higher risk of Alzheimer's, dementia, heart disease, stroke, and early death. And so the estrogen in the dose given to help reverse those symptoms should not be high enough to create more endometriosis because it's basically less or similar to the dose that women would naturally get from their ovaries. And there's no data to show that putting women who are in premature surgical menopause on hormones will cause endometriosis to grow back. It's just a theoretical thought, but there's no evidence or data to support that. 
And so we weigh the risks and benefits. And I always talk to the patients about options because I think patients should be the ones making the decision based on what they think is best for themselves. And I typically do recommend that women go on hormone replacement therapy, estrogen, when they've had their ovaries removed for that reason. Christine, thank you so much for sharing this knowledge and for making a strong case for women to be educated and be persistent with their providers. You're very welcome. I completely support women's decisions. And I think that as women, we are... We should be advocating for ourselves. We should be making decisions with regards to our body and our health. And so if you ever see a doctor that's not listening to your symptom and whether it's pain or you know anything, dry eyes, painful bowel movements, then find someone else who will listen because there is always going to be someone who's going to take your symptoms seriously and who's going to help you figure out what's going on with your body. I would have never thought to inform my gynecologist of my frequent shortness of breath. Yes, please do. That's very true, Christine, especially if you have history of endometriosis and you're right, you may not have associated the two together, but it's definitely worth discussing it with your gynecologist. Okay, let me see, Melody. I had a lap done for bilateral endometriomas by a GYN who was not experienced with endometriosis. She drained the cyst and did not remove them. She did not remove the endometriosis, but what told me it was on my bowel. These cysts have come back and I still have endometriosis symptoms and I'm seeking an experienced excision specialist. What type of imaging do you do on new patients prior to surgery for endometriosis for bowel symptoms? Excellent question, Melody. And actually, I think your gynecologist did a really good thing by at least recognizing that there were lesions that were suspicious for endometriosis on the bowel, documenting those lesions and telling you about them. Because a lot of, of, of surgeons, especially if they're general surgeons or bowel surgeons, may not know what those lesions look like and they may completely ignore them and not even recognize that they're there. And so recognizing that something is going on is usually the first step. Draining the endometriomas, unfortunately, does increase the risk of them coming back for the same reason we talked about with medication is that when we drain them, we're not really removing the glands and stroma that are around the cyst. We're just removing the content of that cyst. And so the glands and stroma, because they're there, they can slowly start producing that inflammatory fluid again, and that cyst can fill up and grow. Um, imaging for bowel bowels, uh, endometriosis. So an MRI is usually a good imaging modality to look at deep lesions of the bowel that are large. But a lot of the lesions that I showed you that are superficial will not show on any imaging test. Some people have experience doing a deep pelvic ultrasound. So a Mayo Clinic where I trained, they had a really good team of radiologists that can do deep pelvic ultrasounds that would provide the same experience, the same um, clinical exposure or information as an MRI. Not better than an MRI, but equivalent to an MRI. Now, an ultrasound is very provider dependent, so it depends on the person doing the scan. It takes about an hour. It's a really long protocol. And so doing that versus an MRI probably gives us the same information. However, if I'm very suspicious for bowel endometriosis, even with a normal MRI, I will still talk to the patient about possibly needing to have the, those lesions removed and having bowel surgery done. And so having had your gynecologist see that there's something abnormal on the bowel, I think is enough for your future surgeon to go in knowing that they may need to do some bowel work. Okay, next question. Can you talk more about endometriosis and autoimmune connection? Very good question. So I didn't really talk about how endometriosis grows, where it comes from, because I really wanted to kind of focus on the atypical locations that can get forgotten sometimes. But endometriosis is an inflammatory process. Now we have those lesions that are not supposed to be there. They cause a lot of inflammation. Endometriosis has been associated with a lot of other disorders. We know that women who have pelvic pain and endometriosis can also have interstitial cystitis. We know that women who have endometriosis can also have malarian anomalies, so uterine tract anomalies. And actually, we think that the uterine tract anomalies are probably what increase the risk of developing endometriosis. 
autoimmune disorders, the data is very variable. We can't really say for sure if there's a certain disease that's more prevalent with women who have endometriosis, but we know that because of all the inflammation that's been going on in the pelvis, women can have other immune disorders going on as well. We have five minutes, so I want to go over everybody's questions. If we keep, if you kept your ovaries during hysterectomy excision surgery, do you need to take hormones to replace normal levels of estrogen? We don't. And that's why my approach typically is to preserve the ovaries. Because if I remove all the disease around the ovaries, and if I remove all the endometriosis, then the ovaries can be producing the natural estrogen. If we don't remove the ovaries, women don't need estrogen replacement. If the ovaries look diseased, and unfortunately, sometimes there's no way of saving the ovaries. They're just covered with endometriosis. They're stuck to the uterus. They're stuck to all the disease. And leaving the ovaries means leaving disease then I don't recommend that. I do recommend removing the ovaries and putting women on estrogen replacement therapy after surgery. My pain and discomfort has always been on the right side. Why does this happen? My appendix has been removed with my last excision surgery. Excellent question. I always, always look at the appendix when doing this endometriosis excision surgery because the appendix can sometimes have lesions on it that could be endometriosis or even if they're not endometriosis, they may be causing pain. A lot of other things cause pain as well. And so even after we remove all the disease, remove the appendix, endometriosis, whether it's on the bowel, the ovary, the uterus, the pain does not go away completely because there are a lot of other things going on. I always say that endometriosis surgery or excision is one piece of the puzzle. There are other things going on as well. Pain is typically caused by a multitude of things. And so treating the endometriosis and removing it surgically is the first step. I have not examined you, so I don't know what things look like, but myofascial pelvic pain, which is muscle pain, is very common with women who have endometriosis. And because when women are in pain for a long time, the muscles down below get really tight and tense. Think about it. I'm sitting on my chair and my shoulders hurt already. And I was operating this morning. And if I push on my shoulders right now, I'll feel pain. Shoulders you know, technically are not supposed to be painful, right? If you don't have muscle tension, your shoulders shouldn't hurt. Same thing happens down in the vaginal area or in the muscles of the abdominal wall. The vagina shouldn't be painful. The abdominal wall shouldn't be painful. So when we do an exam and we touch those areas and women experience pain, then that kind of is a clue that there's some muscle tension going on down below. And the best way to target that type of pain is pelvic floor physical therapy. So the physical therapy can help relax those muscles through certain exercises. Then there's neuropathic pain because the nerves have been aggravated from pain for such a long time, they become very sensitive. So again, stimulus that doesn't typically cause pain can cause pain when we have a lot of those nerve fibers present. And so targeting that neuropathic aspect of pain with some neuromodulators is also sometimes an essential part of the plan when treating pain associated with endometriosis. I see part of a question. Can you always, I don't know what, what the rest of it is. Thank you, doctor. We have about 11 questions in our Q and A. Okay. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm wondering if I can send those to you and possibly yeah. on whenever you're able to, um, if you can respond to them and then I'll share it with I'll share the responses with all. Yes, I will be more than happy to do that. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize there was a Q&A. I was just looking at the chat. We've all been doing Zoom too much right now, nowadays. And so I want everybody to, to please get up and stretch. This has been a great hour. I really enjoy talking to women about endometriosis. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or reach out to Blanca and she will send me your questions. I'll be happy to answer them and send them back to you. Thank you so much. One of the questions is, is this recorded? Can we rewatch it later? Yes, to both of those questions. It'll be uploaded on our YouTube page. I also have the presentation um, that I'm able to share with everyone. Um, so yeah, I just wanna go ahead and end it with um, thanking you, Dr. Babahani, for, for just sharing this knowledge today and taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to us today. You're and welcome. Thank, thank you everybody for, for joining us. us today. Have a great day. Yes, you Bye -bye. as well. Bye-bye.